Our scripture passage this morning comes from Romans chapter 1, verses 8 through 17. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you, for I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Ryan. Well, let me invite you to go ahead and grab your Bibles this morning and open up to the first chapter of the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1. We're going to continue with this verse by verse study this morning of the book of Romans. And man, I'm still reeling a little bit from that song. God is good. Amen. I imagine no matter where you are or what your week was like or what the week you have coming up, It is good to be reminded with one another that God is good. So thank you, worship team, for leading us in that this morning. Uh, We're going to begin around verse 8, but just want to remind you we're walking through this incredible New Testament book that's been called the greatest letter ever written. And we are walking through it on Sunday mornings in our worship gatherings. We are walking through this book in our life groups. Hope you're a part of one that's studying through the book of Romans together and pressing these things out. We're reading the book of Romans. If you need a reading guide, there's one available online. There's also a paper copy that you can pick up out here in the foyer on your way out. And just want to remind you also of another option, an opportunity called Behind the Message. Uh, Behind the Message happens every Wednesday night, 6.30 here in this building, and we get together, and whoever teaching pastor is, we press down into the message a little bit more. And one thing I just want to point out to you, we want As we walk through Romans, you're going to have a ton of questions about the book of Romans. That's natural. So we've created uh, an email link called Behind the Message at tcbchurch.org. And as you have questions, if you'll just email those to us, we'll wrestle with those and deal with a lot of them uh, in that Wednesday night format, Behind the Message. So write that down, or you can probably remember it, Behind the Message at tcbchurch.org. It's an opportunity for us to dive down deeper around your questions into the book of Romans. All right? So chapter 1, we said last week that this is easily the greatest letter that's ever been written. Uh, Timothy Keller said that history reveals that the book of Romans repeatedly changes the world by changing people. Now Paul is writing this letter to a group of believers in what is the de facto capital of the world, Rome. It's the intellectual capital of the world. It's where all the intellectuals, and of that day it was perceived that that's where the wise people live, is in the city of Rome. So Paul's critics said to him, Paul, you'll preach this gospel of Jesus, that Jesus saves wicked sinners and Jesus alone saves. You'll preach this gospel anywhere in the Roman world, but you're not coming to Rome, Paul. So there's some criticisms of Paul because Paul has never been to Rome at this point. And he's been all over Asia Minor and he's been all over different places. But there was a lot of criticism that says, Paul, you'll preach to those Galatians and you'll preach to the Gauls and you'll preach to the barbarians. And Paul, but you're not coming to Rome because you're ashamed of that gospel. Because you know, Paul, you come to the Oxford of the day, or you come to the Harvard of the day, or in my neck of the woods, the Unicoi County High School of the day, then you're going to face some difficulty. Paul, you're, you're ashamed of this message, Paul. 
So in many ways, Paul writes this letter. He writes it as a support letter that he's getting ready to go to Spain. He also writes it in defense of the gospel of the good news. This announcement that we say is the gospel. We said it last week. The gospel is primarily, it is an announcement. It is a declaration that God has done everything necessary to reconcile man to himself through Jesus Christ. It is done. And we announce that. That's the proclamation of the gospel. So Paul writes this letter, and you're going to see in these verses we're going to walk through, he is saying, I am eager. I am unashamed of this message of the gospel. So what we're going to do is I'm going to give you a big truth, and then I'm going to give you some supporting big ideas that kind of flow out of that. And then we're going to end this morning in a season of corporate prayer together. We're going to break up in groups and pray over our three names, uh, uh, the, the people on our heart that we know don't, have, don't, don't know Jesus. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But let me give you the big truth first that's going to come out of these verses, and then we'll walk verse by verse beginning in verse 8. So here it is. No surprise, the big truth is this. The gospel is the power to save those who believe. Paul says that. Paul writes that under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. And this morning we're going to focus on that reality that this message of the gospel, of what has been accomplished, God says, is the power to save those who believe. Now let's pick up in verse 8. Paul writes these group of believers and he says this, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. He says, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world or the whole known world. Paul writes them and he says, I'm so encouraged. You could say it this way, what was happening in Rome didn't stay in Rome. The word of their transformation and the word of the power of the gospel in many ways had begun to spread all over the Roman world. And the idea was this, man, if it can happen in Rome... It can happen anywhere. Paul says the message of your testimony, of your faith, is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. Verse 9, Paul says, For God, whom I serve in my spirit, in preaching the gospel of His Son, is my witness, as how, as how unceasingly I make mention of you. There's some great little nuggets through this, and we can't exhaust these verses. This is why we're encouraging you to read it on your own and be discussing it in your life group. Paul says, for God, whom I serve in my spirit. Circle that. It's highly convicting because Paul says in the backdrop of the Jewish culture he was brought up in with their shallow, hypocritical service of these Jewish self-righteous leaders, Paul says, no, 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 I serve God from the overflow of my spirit. The word serve there is the idea of worship. With the backdrop of the pagan, superstitious, driven religion there in Rome, Paul says, no, 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 everything I say, everything I do flows out of a heart of worship of this God. And that's a challenge, is everything we do as believers flow out of a heart of worship based on what Christ has done, or do we drift over into the mindset sometimes that I'm trying to earn something before God? Paul says, I serve God. My God, from my spirit, I worship this God. And I proclaim him as an act of worship. Beautiful challenge for us. Paul continues, verse 10, he says, Always in my prayers I'm making requests. I'm praying for you. Paul had never met many of these believers, but he is praying to God on their behalf. He says, at last, by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you. He says, I want to be there. I've been praying for you. I've been praying God would give me the opportunity to be there in Rome with you. There's no hint of being ashamed or that I don't want to be there in Rome. Verse 11, I long to see you. Now this is so challenging. He says, I long to see you, brothers and sisters, that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. Another power word there. Paul says, I want you to grow. I want you to be growing in your relationship with Christ. I want you to be deeply rooted. The word established is that idea. Firmly established in this gospel message, in your faith in Christ. Paul says, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. Now I'm going to give you a few big ideas that kind of practical things that flow out of these verses. Here's the first one, big idea number one, based on verse 11 and 12. Gospel transformed people 
serve and are served by one another. Isn't that beautiful? Paul says, I can't wait to be there because I want to serve you with the gifts that God has given me that you will be strengthened and you will be established. And when we serve in that way, it is an act of love for one another. But at the same time, the Apostle Paul says, equally, I want to be there so that you can encourage and build me up and invest in me. It is a balance within the body of Christ to say, yes, I want to serve and I want to give my gifts and I want to love my brothers and sisters. At the same time, it is humble dependence and recognition of our weaknesses and the way God has designed the body to say, I equally want to be served by the body of Christ because I need my brothers and sisters. Paul says, I want to be there so you can equally encourage and strengthen me. Often, especially in our hospitality-driven South, we somehow think it's spiritual or godly to push back the service of our brothers and sisters because we got it all covered and we got it all together. Paul says, I want to be there so you can pour into me and invest in me because I need my brothers and sisters in Christ. Any hint that you've got it all together on your own apart from the body of Christ is not some kind of strength. It is arrogance that says, I can do it without the body of Christ for which Christ died and has made me a member. (laughs) Beautiful. Paul recognizes that. He says, I'm coming to serve, and I'm coming to be served. If you're new to Tri-Cities, we have this conversation all the time, and I'm going to say this quickly, but people will come to our church, and they say, man, I'm ready to go. I want to jump right in, and I want to serve, and I want to find a place of service. And I say, that's great, and we, we want you to find a place of service, but at the same time, we do not want you to serve from a place of unhealth. We want you to be healthy. We want you to be being served by the body of Christ so you find your place of stability and connection in the body of Christ from which you can serve others and be served at the same time. That's the way God's designed it, right? Continue on, Paul, verse 13, he says, I I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I'd plan to come to you. I mean, all those guys that are saying I didn't want to be here, they're wrong. I made every plan to come there and have been prevented so far. Over in Romans 15, we won't take time to look at it. Paul says, it's God that prevented me. Supernaturally, God was steering me in other directions. I had every intention of coming to Rome. Paul says, God supernaturally steered me in different directions. I want to be there with you. Now, what's this? Verse 13. So that I may obtain some fruit among you, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. Here's your big idea number two. The gospel is for believers and unbelievers. (laughs) And we could preach all day on this and just stop here, but we've got to do it quick because we're going to get to these next verses. Here's the point. If you approach the book of Romans and you approach the gospel message as something in my rearview mirror, mirror, I believed and now I'm a believer and I leave the gospel behind, you don't understand that the finished work of Jesus Christ, it has implications down into every area of your life. Paul is going to say in Romans 1.17 here in just a few minutes, it is the righteous, by faith the righteous shall live. Faith in what? What Christ has fully accomplished. Paul says, I'm eager to preach this gospel message to you believers. Now, it's obvious that he wants to preach the gospel message to those who don't believe so that they by faith will come to receive Christ. But he equally says, I want to come and preach this gospel message to you believers, meaning... I want you to grow in your understanding and application and living your life out of the power of the gospel of what Christ has accomplished from faith to faith to faith. And not drift over into moralism, not drift over into self-righteousness. That somehow you think, yeah, God saved me, but now it's all up to me. It doesn't work that way. Faith to faith, to faith, to faith. Here's one of my prayers for you. We were asked this Wednesday night and behind the message when we were there. The question was, what did you use one of our elders and our other elders praying for our church? Two things through the book of Romans. Number one, that we would become convinced of how good news 
what good news the gospel is. And secondly, that we would see that the reality of the gospel of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done penetrates down into every area of our lives. Every area. I'll give me some examples really quick. Imagine your marriage and other marriages practicing in your marriage forgiveness the way you have been forgiven by Christ because of the gospel. Does that change marriages? Imagine going to work Monday morning and going to your job and because of the gospel in Colossians 3 and 4, you realize I'm not serving an earthly master, I'm serving Christ who is my master and you work your job, whether you're pushing a cart or you're dealing in stocks and bonds, whatever it might be, you realize I'm serving my Christ today. Would that change the way you do your job? How about you live your life and you realize that in the gospel of Jesus Christ by faith, I am fully accepted by God himself and he has made me and called me blameless and righteous before God. Does that change the way you no longer have to seek acceptance from every person you find and try to find your identity in every source on the planet and you realize I wake up every morning and I'm loved and accepted by God? Does that change your life? Does it change the way you fight sin to realize because of the cross and because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you are no longer a slave to sin. It is no longer your master. Does that affect the way you live your life? Paul said, for my part, I'm eager to preach this gospel among you, even as the rest of the Gentiles. Timothy Keller said it this way, everyone needs the gospel, both the you inside the church and you who are yet outside of it. The gospel is the way we are, the people are called to faith and the way we grow in faith. Is understanding the implications of this finished work of Jesus Christ into every area of our life. Press on. There's a lot here, right? Paul continues on, verse 14. He says, He says, I'm under obligation. He says, I'm under obligation both to the Greeks, they were the elite of the day. And to the barbarians, they were the foolish of the day. It's a word play. In the original language, someone who couldn't speak the Greek language, they were called (laughs) barbars. It was slang. And from that came the word barbarian. Barbarian means they don't even know the Greek language. They're fools. They're the ones that it might be easy to determine, you know what? They don't really need or even deserve the gospel. They're the ones that you, in your own mind, whatever group that is, that you determine, I don't know that I love them as much as these other people. And you can fill in the blank, whoever that is. Paul says, no, no, I'm under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to the wise and to the foolish. Big idea number three is this. We owe the gospel to those who are like us and those who are not. Obligation here doesn't mean God is... Paul is trying to earn God's favor. It's the sense that I have been entrusted with something for you. If I give you $100 and I say, you take this $100 and it's really Daniel Broyles' money, you make sure you get it to him, then you're going to send some obligation, I hope, to get that money to him because I gave it to you for him. We've been entrusted the gospel for us and we've been entrusted the gospel for the Greeks and the barbarians and everyone in between. And Paul says, I have an obligation to take this gospel to those who are like me, the elite, those I'm comfortable with, those who fit my socioeconomic category, and I'm challenged to take the gospel to those who are completely unlike me, and those that I don't even like, or those I'm even uncomfortable around, or those that I may somehow determine are not worthy of the love of God. Paul says, we're under obligation to take to the Jews and Greeks and barbarians alike. Paul's point is that God is no respecter of persons. The gospel must be preached both in the world's elite and to its outcasts, John MacArthur said. So Paul's steering towards something here, and this is where we're going to spend the rest of our time. He's trying to get to verse 15, 16, and 17, and he's he's declaring, "I, I want you to know I'm not ashamed of this message. So he gets to verse 15, and he says, so for my part, I am eager 
The word eager means willing, I'm ready. It's the exact opposite of being ashamed or withdrawn or pulling back. Paul says, no, 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 I'm eager to preach this gospel to you who are in Rome. And he goes on, and the next two verses I'm just going to tell you are really the theme verses of the whole book of Romans. We're not going to have time to take them apart like we would like. We'll keep coming back to them. But these are the central core of the whole book of Romans and really the whole Bible. Paul says, for, here's the basis of what I've been saying, I am not ashamed of this message. I'm not ashamed of the reality that God has chosen to reconcile guilty sinners through the weakness of a son dying on the cross and raising from the dead. And that is the only way mankind can be reconciled. And that may sound foolish, Paul says. That may not make sense to your elites. I am not ashamed of that message. Why, Paul? Because I'm such a good orator and my skills are so incredible that people are compelled when I speak. Paul says, for, the word for there again is the basis of what he's saying. He says, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first. They receive the gospel message first and then also to the Greek, the rest of the world. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of this message. And here's your big idea number four. We are, not, we are unashamed of the gospel because of its power. Sometimes we talk about being unashamed and our conversation drifts because of our fearfulness. Because we're thinking, okay, there's something lacking within me and I'm fearful. That's not primarily what Paul's talking about here. He's saying, do not be unashamed of the gospel because you think there's something lacking in the message. Paul says there is nothing lacking in the message of Jesus and his cross and his resurrection to redeem man. Paul says there is a power. The word is dunamis. We get the word dynamite from it. It doesn't mean the word authority. It means the word power that within the message itself there is a power. So often we forget that and we do drift over to my presentation and my skills and my abilities. Paul says, don't you get it? The message you hold in your hand and you have in your heart, there is power in the message of the gospel. It is not merely a concept. It is not merely a philosophy. It is not even merely words. It is the power of God to save those who believe. Timothy Keller again says, in the gospel, words and power come together. He doesn't, Paul, say it brings power or has power, but that it, the gospel message, actually is power. The gospel message is actually the power of God in verbal form. Contained in that message is the power to save and the only power to save. Paul, power for what? He says it is power for salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Greek. So Paul is saying to the cultural elites who might want to tap their foot and look down their nose in scorn at this ridiculous message, he would say, listen, you can make fun of the message of the gospel all you want, but the gospel message has a power in it that no other message on the planet has. None. Paul says, for that reason, I'm unashamed. He's not talking about his own fear. He's talking about, I have confidence in the power of this message that I speak. 1 Corinthians 1.18, Paul said it this way, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Your gospel message that has transformed your life, you have that entrusted to you, and there is a power in it. Paul says, I'm unashamed. I'll give you an illustration really quick. I am unashamed of the power of electricity. And so are you. Nobody, I don't think, got up this morning and ran over to your light switch and said, okay, I don't know if this electricity thing's going to work or not, but we're going to give it a shot. Wham! Look at that amazing. 
Electricity has a power in it. It is the power. And when it's linked to that bulb, transformation takes place. And that bulb illuminates this light, this electricity has this power. You're not ashamed of the power of electricity. But here's the point. What connects the power of the electricity to the bulb is something called a switch. And you flip that switch on. Paul says in the same way that the switch is the connector between the power of electricity and that bulb, faith is that switch or connector that connects the power of the gospel to the souls of men and women. He says, I'm not ashamed of the power of this message, for in it is the power of God to salvation. For who? Those who flip the switch. And they don't flip the switch, by the way. God flips the switch. But the switch is faith and belief and trusting to all those who believe. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of this gospel because it has power. It is power. Second reason Paul is not ashamed of this gospel, and I've got just a few minutes before we have a time of prayer, and I want you to see this. Paul says in verse 16, I, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because of its power. Then he goes to verse 17, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Paul, what are you talking about? Let's do it this way. Your, your fifth big idea is this. We are unashamed of the gospel because of what it reveals. The word reveals here is the idea of to pull back the curtain on something. To make something seen and understood that previously was not seen and understood. Even take it to another level, it's the idea that it is a revealing that only God can do. It's the revealing of something that man left to himself would never come to this conclusion. In fancy language, it's a theological passive. God does it. God does the revealing. God, through the gospel message, reveals something to us before that was a mystery or an enigma that doesn't make any sense to us. What is that? Paul says, God in the gospel has revealed the righteousness of God. What does that mean? You know, obviously we could spend weeks and weeks, and Paul's going to unpack this through the rest of the book of Romans, but he says, in the message of the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Help me with that, Pastor Mike. What do you mean by that? Sometimes in your Bible, the idea of the righteousness of God means the perfect, blameless character of who God is. God is not striving to be righteous. He is is righteous in himself he doesn't live by some standard he is the standard of righteousness perfection moral blamelessness holiness all of that wrapped up God is righteous it's who he is and that's shouting ground and amen ground until you remember what Paul teaches in Romans 1 2 and 3 that we because of our sin are completely unrighteous whatsoever None righteous, no, not one. Problem. Problem. Sometimes the word righteousness of God in the Bible means God's moral character, what we just talked about. Sometimes it refers to a standing before God. It's the idea that I, if I go to my bank and I've paid all my debts and I owe them nothing and I'm all clear, I'm in right standing with my bank. I'm blameless, if you will, in a sense. There's no faults against me. That's another nuance to the idea of the righteousness of God. So here's the enigma or here's the challenge of the Bible. Ready? How can a loving, righteous God who can never say, do anything that has even a hint of unrighteousness. He can't because he will no longer be God. How can a righteous God righteously redeem those who are so woefully unrighteous? What's the answer? What's the answer? Some want to say, well here's your answer. God is love. And he is. Never ceases to be loving. God is good. We just sang about it. 
And he is. But you got to understand, God's righteousness or his love or his goodness never supersede the other. He's all of that in perfection all the time. In other words, his love doesn't supersede his righteousness. God can't wink at your sin. Can't. You say, come on, Pastor Mike, I'm not a bad dude. I kind of, I mess up every now and then, but I'm not that bad, and you're not even saying it, but in the back of my, your mind you're saying, I'm not as bad as mm-hmm, whoever, right? God would be unjust to wink at sin and therefore would no longer be God. Let me give you an illustration. How many of you would celebrate if the judge downtown next week says to a serial child molester, Sir, we know your history for years has been molesting young children, but you know what? I like you. And I'm going to give you a pass. And everyone in the courtroom that had any sense of justice would rise to their feet and say, That is not just. Let me tell you something. Compared to the righteousness of God, we're a whole lot closer to Hitler and every child molester than we are to the perfect righteousness of God. And that's where we're going next week. Paul explains that you need a righteous means to redeem us to a righteous God. What's the answer? The gospel says this God took on flesh came and bore your sin so that he could righteously forgive and redeem. And he took that sin upon himself in a righteous, holy way. The righteous one for the unrighteous one. And then you say, well, he takes my sin, yes. And that's the glory of the gospel. But I still need righteousness. Where does it come from? I earn it? No, 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 no. Even pictured all the way back in the book of Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned, God took an animal skin and he wrapped them in that animal skin as a picture of the gospel that says, I will impute my very righteousness to your account. That's glorious! Every other system in the world says, i got to figure it out, i got to earn it, well, God will wink at it, well, i got to be good enough, I, or I'm not that bad, whatever it is. No, no, no. Righteousness achieved, righteousness fulfilled, righteousness given by the righteous King of kings, Jesus Christ, who dies in your place and raises from the dead. And God, because of that, has declared every believer to be right in his sight. And how's that happen? Paul says, from faith to faith. 117. Begins with faith, ends with faith. Faith unto faith. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The power and what is revealed in it. I don't want you to check out, but I'm going to ask the team to come on up and just begin to play. And I'm going I'm to kind of lead us into a season of prayer about being... I'm going to pray for those around us that don't know Jesus. We're going to record some names on our little three-name card. But first, I want to go into the season with a kind of a closing illustration. What do you mean, unashamed? What does it mean to be unashamed of this message? A few weeks ago, many of you guys know about a family in our church, Greg and Carolyn Oliphant and their daughter, Leanne. Had a pretty serious situation happen in their home with a house fire. If you don't know what happened, I'll just quickly tell you the story and it's going to lead into our time of prayer. But in the middle of the night, their attic caught on fire, ablaze. And as they in their home slept with their kids, they had no idea what was going on. The neighbor next door woke up providentially, looked out his window and saw that the top of their house was completely consumed with flames and realized those in the house had no idea what was happening. In the middle of the night, that neighbor runs out from his house, he runs to their door, and with great passion and zeal is pounding on their door, pounding on their door, get out, get out, get out. He realized they didn't even know it. And what's this? He knew that in his message was the power of life and death. He was not ashamed in the middle of the night to go pounding on the door. And Greg and Carolyn tell me when they got to the door, they finally got the family out. And within a minute, 
of when they were brought out of the house, the whole house was consumed. Here's the point. That neighbor was unashamed of his message. He knew it was the difference, the power to save and get them out of the house. And he went with great passion and zeal. He knew he was unashamed of that message. We have a message that is infinitely more important, infinitely more true, infinitely more pertinent that Jesus and Jesus alone saves. And in the message of the gospel, there is power. And in the message of the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. God, help us to be unashamed. You bow your head. We're going to do it this way. We're going to walk through some different seasons of prayer together. Pastor Jeff's going to come and lead this time in just a moment. But I want to just ask you, just right there on your own, first kind of season of prayer is this. It, it is very easy for all of us to drift into being ashamed of the gospel and not even realize it. Ashamed of the gospel because in our heart of hearts we doubt its power. Ashamed of the gospel because in our heart of hearts we believe that the rebellion of men and women is maybe greater than that gospel message we share so we're reluctant or we somehow trust our ability well I'm not capable I'm not able I'm not worthy Paul says I'm unashamed of the gospel it is the power of God I just encourage you to take a minute here before Jeff comes and right there before the Lord just you and the Lord there may be a season of confession there may need to be a moment of repentance of, Lord, God, forgive me for any hint of being ashamed of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, Lord, you forgive me. God, I'm calling it what it is. It's sin and unbelief. And you just take a minute there before the Lord and do business with God. And then Pastor Jeff's going to come and lead us in further season of prayer this morning.